tired of everybody knowing where I'm at, my whereabouts Rappers who ain't recording, just sitting home chewing bean sprouts Lazy boys who sink in the couch, that's why I'm tired They deny it in private What's up guys, this is the Eric Barber here And I am joined with the man with a hundred alter egos Black Elvis, Dr. Octagon I'm here with Cool Keith How we doing today, man? I'm okay. How you doing? I'm just chilling. You know, we in Ann Arbor. You know, they just won the um, football college game. You know, hey, what can you say? For sure, bro. And I got to say, that show was electric, man. Uh, when was the last time you were in Michigan? Uh, since the COVID-19, been a long time since. I don't think I've been in Michigan in about six years, three or four years. Wow, bro. Well, hey, welcome back, man. I'm really glad to have you back. And uh, first of all, man, I want to really give you your props, bro. I mean, you are one of the most versatile artists. And also, you got some of the most longevity out of any artist, right? Like, you got, you know, 35 years going for you, man. Uh, yeah. What do you attribute your uh, longevity in the space to? What I attribute it to? Just being me, just, you know, leisurely going into the music business, uh, shopping. My dedication is that staying in fashion is good for me, basically, uh, to drive and thrive musically and stay like on top of what's going on, the styles, trends. I think it's a, a total all around thing from you knowing the latest style of clothes to, you know, the latest cadence of rap, the latest rapper that's out, the latest artist, you know, all oh, it, it helps. I think it helped me stay current and relevant. No doubt, bro. And I mean, you're talking about the trends, uh, but I've noticed that, you know, throughout times, you've actually set the trends, right? I mean, you invented porno core, uh, some you you had you pioneered horrorcore. And underground in general, right? Like you had a massive impact there. Um, what do you feel like allowed you to pave the way and create new uh, art there? Um, I'm just constantly working. Like you said, the music industry has a big gap in it and it's a gap to do anything you want. A lot of people don't take advantage of it, but I try to take advantage of it as most the poss most possible advantage of it. What I do is try to keep creating, making new stuff, going to the studio every day. That's what I thrive to do to make things different. Uh, and what I want to make different, okay, what I want to make different is um, change, basically. Being able to do different stuff and, you know, make it work. Nice, man. I love it. And, you know, when it comes to your famous uh, alter egos, right, um, I've noticed that some, you know, kind of have a little bit more staying power than others. Some are, you know, just kind of used a little bit. Some are like the basis of full albums like Black Elvis, Black Elvis 2. Um, what's really the big determinant for that? Put it all to egos in different ways. Uh, it helps me balance a lot of the work I do. I mean, I do so much work even with groups and friends and stuff like that. But even on top of that, I got a lot of work with different people. I think a lot of people don't work at the speed I work. So I have to have so many other things to give it a break and a breather to do tracks. But I remember one time I was in LA and I seen this guy playing chess. And he was playing chess by himself, but he was playing 12 tables by himself and he had everybody stuck. I think that's how I am too, you know, my work ethnics for a lot of people around me, for groups, solo stuff. I think a lot of people don't work at my pace, so I, I tend to like um, gear into other projects because of the speed. So when I work with other groups and people, even my own group, you know, it's hard because the speed. So I think I make so much material faster than I be with a group. It's simple for me to put an album together with a group. And then it's more faster for me to do solo projects alone. But me working with a group, sometimes groups with S's on them. I, I, I do a lot of stuff. I, I just do my part so fast. Like, even if it's my part, you know, 
if it, if it's an album we working on, I do my parts quickly, you know, so we finish. I just knock out the key to me is is to knock out everything I'm doing. I knock out everything. I don't leave no verse hanging. I don't leave a feature hanging. I, I just knock out everything and move on to the next stuff. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm piled up with so much solo work I'm, and the end group work. So I love that, bro. And, you know, piggybacking off the last question, um, when it comes to your alter egos, um, how specifically uh, do you, like, write for them? Do you, like, try to write in different cadences or flows um, with them? And do you ever find that to be challenging? Um, I do features so much. I get different kind of beats, but sometimes the beats are funny to me. Sometimes they're real serious. Sometimes they're hard. Sometimes they're soft. Sometimes they're happy. Sometimes they're jobs. Sometimes they're radical. You know, it's a challenge for me to write to all different kinds of beats because I think sometimes people want to challenge me. They're like, well, you know, he has a pre- Cadence that he uses most of the time. Let me try to take him out of his norm. I, I, I don't have a problem, but it's I've been doing features. I get all kinds of jobs that beats you wouldn't believe they want me to rap on. I rap on them. I do whatever they make, I do it. I mean, people want to, you know, experiment with me on something. You know, that's on them if they want to waste the track experimenting, but I get on the song, you know, they, they pay me professional. I get on the song with the songs I get on. I like this beats, you know, I don't worked with a lot of groups and different things and did a lot of projects and this beats you hate, but you work on them, you know, but I look at it as the challenges. Okay. The beat is not all that. I don't like it, but I, I rap on it just to prove the show. I can rap on it, but that's what the artist makes. If they want somebody to rap on it, they might make, any kind of beat and they want the artist to be on it that they like so I do the beat you know I do it because that's their beat but I don't have no responsibility for me making the beat got it and I noticed that you've uh, done a work with I mean we're kind of in the Detroit area notice you've done a lot of work with Detroit artists I mean you just had Super MC up here tonight oh, yeah. um, you uh, just did a track of Z Loopers um, sorry, you could go into Super MC real quick. Super is always a great person, you know. He gets around, he comes always around, and like he's real fun on stage. He makes the job easier. You get on stage with him, you know. You go back and forth. He, you know, he's like, you know, he's like another rapper. I know, like Aguilar. Some of those guys can rap like the whole night. They can rap like hours off the clock. Yeah. And be saying real shit at the same time. So that's what's good. And that's an art, too, to be up on stage and stay up there for a long time. Yeah, no doubt. Um, and, you know, one other very prolific artist that you have worked with that I did want to ask you about, because I feel like your uh, work together is so interesting. Um, and I feel like you've influenced him in some ways is uh, MF Doom. Um, do you have any memories of, you know, working with him back in your uh, 2016 project? Yeah, me and MF Doom did a lot of stuff with Cutmaster Kurt, you know, Victor hey. Vaughn, of course. Um, you know, I did the Super Heroes beat, and um, that was a good beat I gave him, and um, it turned out to be so popular. And, um, you know, I like MF Doom. You know, he says some crazy stuff when he raps. It's crazy, like... A lot of one thing about MF Doom's lyrics, if they don't hit you right away, you'll be playing something he made in a later time and it hits you. You'll be like, damn, that shit went by in my head, but I caught it now. Like, that's what's good about it. A lot of his stuff can hit you like, like it's brand new again. So every time he says something, you might learn something else and then you listen to more paragraphs. You like, sometimes he got riddles and you figure it out later. You're like, oh shit, that's what he meant. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. I kind of feel the same way about your song sometimes too, to be honest. Well, you have slight riddles in them. You know, you got to get them, but it's funny because people don't be, you know, they be, they be flying over their head like a jet. <laughs> Love it. And, uh, you know, some of your uh, work has been super prolific all the way from, you know, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, 2020s. Uh, for you, what project or you can name a couple projects are you most uh, proud of? I like Sex Styles. 
the album. I like Matthew. I like Spank Master. I like Dr. Octagon, Black Elvis 2, Dr. Doom. I like, um, you know, KHM. I like, um, Analog Brothers. You know, I, I got so many projects that I like. I got so many, so many projects that I like. Very many, many, many projects. Um, it's, it's, I can't go for them forever. You know, and, you know, Undertaker's album, you know, and I'm still working on albums. So, um, the Keith album, you know, the Feature Magnetic album, you know, it's a lot of records. And, uh, that, that's really great to hear. Are there any that you feel like maybe you regret at all or is it all? Good. Um, let me read one album. I, I think I regretted making the um, the second Octagon album because me and Cuba wasn't totally involved in it. What Automator made, you know, Octagon Two was like when what's the you know the latest album that Octagon produced with me and with Automator, not the first original Octagon album. I think that second Octagon album. The beats were just totally off from what we first was doing. And then the automator, you know, didn't want to go with the formula we had. The first formula was us and me and him playing bass lines. He, he never wanted to go with that um formula again. Automator went and changed up in the production. And then that album, like, like, the first octagon, the beats was just dope and dope and dope. The second one was like, you know, I don't know what what he was thinking about. I just thought we could have got together and made an album on our own. I think he should have stuck with what we did. The album, the first album was successful because me, him, and Cuba was all in it with him and, and the music and me playing basses, basses and stuff and the raw drums and stuff. I think the second album, I think... He wanted to experiment more. We should have just went with the formula of the first album, you know, just go, like you said, go get the donuts and go into his um, attic and make the tracks. But he changed up the whole circumference of the album, like just the work ethics, the way to do it. You know, when I was in L.A. doing, when I was in San Francisco doing the first album, it was better for me because me and him had a free way of working. I go shopping in the morning, knock the octagon stuff out at night. And he didn't want to do that in the out in this time, you know. He wanted to go with, like you said, a kind of corporate way of recording. Yeah, got it. Yeah, that's unfortunate, man. Um, are there any projects that uh, fans of yours can look forward to in the near future? Um, well, we got the Broadway Billy stuff with Rock Marcy and, uh, you know, my boy Josh Sway from Gallery Department, Art That Kills. Um, you got Caesar Face with, you know, me and Esoteric, Inspect the Deck, stuff like that. You know, I just got finished the Real Batman Project. It, you know, just in color collab albums and my solo album you know and maybe say I got a solo album it's just the mostly like you said the feature the guest stars and stuff like that very cool and uh keith if you got any kind of final positive message for anyone that may be watching this Rhino. Say that again one more time. Uh, you got any kind of final positive message for anyone that may be watching? Uh, just stay original. Keep what you're doing. And, you know, don't let a lot of rappers tell you that, you know, you should stop what you're doing. I mean, I think like a lot of rappers degenerate a lot of young kids from making records, not with, per se, drugs or getting on all kinds of substances. I think it's with success what it comes with like you know you see a lot of rappers they go through a time of um being successful and then then they have a downside and then the kids get to see that stuff and the downside start to look like 
why were they famous in the first place? So a lot of the artists get famous, they change, then they go in the music business, they start complaining that they got to make a certain record now. You know, you hear a lot of artists now, they're, they're going through their, I guess it's their sophomore jinx. Me, I never used the sophomore jinx. I think a lot of rappers feel like, you know, if I can't do what I did on my first album, it's not right to record anymore. Uh, you know, and they, you know, and they, it's a kind of a not so cool of a message. You know, everybody feels like, you know, I have nothing to write about, no subjects. It's just rap, really. But I, it's funny when people go through these different troubles and ups and downs and music. And it started to sound like a depression thing, you know, like, you know, what was rap for? It was for to, for to be successful. It was there for to be uh, happy and going up tempo. Now everybody's feeling like I've been up there. Now I don't want it no more. I don't like it. You know, so you get a lot of different kind of feedback now for kids. You know, they watching that stuff, too. So. And they looking at it as like, oh, this is the end of the road. This is what happens when artists go through midlife crisis. They change. They say they don't want to record. They quit. Or they start, you know, I think everybody start going through different kind of circles. And I think people want to just hear like, well, I want to beg you to come back to do a song. I want to beg you to rap. So a lot of these guys go through different syndromes of till I, you know, till it gets to be, are you going to make a record again? Are you going to make a record again? Are you going to record again? So people is always, uh, I'm going to beg you to rap. I'm going to beg you to make an album. I'm going to beg you to come back. You know, I think as artists, you know, music, like basketball, people play it on out to the end. Hockey, people play it out on the end. You know, rap has a lot of a lot of feedback to it like people feel like it's a time to stop to me it's an everlasting hobby and also uh, therapeutic these guys make these records and they seem like they gotta go to mental ho mental homes and stuff like that or they gotta be in places that's not so good or they need help and all this and they got to go get special special services and stuff. So I, I see that a lot too. Everybody's, you know, rappers turn into different things and, you know, they some start going into being an anchor man. Some start going and making podcasts. So, some Then some don't make music at all. They like, like, I think they blame the music industry for their pain or something. They couldn't take it. So, what is, which is too, a lot of people can't take that business. They can't take the music business because it's, it's, it's kind of solid and rough. Like, you know, like boot camp, Paris Island. They, they do it one time, you know, they can't do it again. They can't, the fame, the fame hurts the people like, yo, when are you going to record? When are you going to do something? You know, everybody take time off to make themselves look important. But I think like a lot of these artists try to follow the the rock group trend. You know, they rock group make a record every seven years. They're like, oh, you know, Elton John ain't going to record a record for about five, six years now. But in your, you know, you're not Elton John. At the end of the day, you're not Elton John. So this is rap. So a lot of the groups start to get this, a lot of artists start to get that mentality of they're big artists that they can make a record every seven years. You know, it's it's crazy. Make a record, I say make a record tomorrow, make a record the next day, make a record when you feel like making a record, but don't come with excuses. And because when you was starving, like, and you forgot where that stuff evolved from, you like, well, my mind is like, I don't want to make a record no more. A lot of these groups, they everybody have mental breakdowns and stuff like that because they feel like making a record is, is starting to become a like a math arithmetic problem. Like, yo, I don't know how to record no more. I made a record. I quit. Um, 
you know, I don't think I could have been as successful as my first record and stuff like that. I think a lot of people are worrying about their second time out, their third album, their fourth album, fifth album. Even if they did five albums, they worrying about the sixth album. You know, I think it's I think a lot of people are afraid of failure. They feel like they want to go out on the top, but that's not the point. Like, you know, you don't box. 25 fighters and quit because you knocked them all out. You just do other stuff if you feel it. But they don't want to do nothing like that. They feel, you know, ah, it's time to get weird because I'm not making any more records. But some people got regular issues. A lot of these artists got regular issues and they didn't really know the fame popped back in their face so fast that their minds are sh shackled. And they don't have a mind to say, you know, let me do this. Well, how I originally came, started doing this. They start to be like, oh, I made the records now. Everybody's now. It's the new thing is not to make records and for people to beg you to make records. That's the new, that's like the new trend now. Like people is like, like an artist. It's like me talking for years and years. I don't make songs. I'm not writing lyrics no more. Yeah, you know, people get off on that like, yeah, you know, I play handball now. I don't write lyrics no more. And, and you know, I collect marbles and stuff. You know, I do stuff to show you I'm collecting marbles and and I start talking silly shit. Like, you know, rap, I don't really feel it no more how I was and I you know you got a lot of people that everybody's doing that that's for, that's like the latest trend what do you think I mean I see that a lot sure man I mean I agree with you I do see uh, even like Lil Yachty complained about uh, where hip hop's at right now um, yeah I think I think that makes sense I mean I for one dude I love your level of output I mean you're at Aren't you at four albums this year right now? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's high. That's good. I did a lot of albums and finished them and moved on. But like you said, a lot of people get mental block. And it's not even the beach or nothing where they went to on, on a vacation. It's just they can't think of nothing different. Definitely. And you mentioned Marvel. I noticed that a lot of your, you know, some of your monikers, your album covers, uh, your lyrics, they kind of do touch on Marvel. You're definitely... A fan older than the MCU, which is uh, really cool. You know, who's your favorite uh, Marvel character? My favorite Marvel character was always Ben Grimm. Ben Grimm? Uh, what? Rocks on his body. Yeah. Then he tries to wear underwear, like with rocks, like his body's all rock. You know. That's smart. Yeah, I like that. Just because he's a goofy dude? Yeah. Do you relate to him at all, or is it... No, I like I always kind of liked the, the Fantastic Four. They was a great comic, you know, like a unit, a team, you know, Reed Richards and Sue and all of that. And, you know, the Blaze and Johnny Blaze. And just like you said, the Fantastic Four is a different type of entity. You know, I, I mean, I follow a lot of the stuff, even from the Silver Surfer and the Iceman, all that stuff. You know, it's still like different stuff. I love it, dude. And, you know, here's hoping they get a good movie um, at some point, you know. That'd be nice. Yeah, definitely. And uh, so we're kind of getting close to wrapping up the interview. Um, I did notice a lot of your uh, um, lines are uh, pretty referential to, like, movies and stuff. Do you have, like, a favorite movie? Um, I like Evil Dead. Oh, okay. Nice. I I like a lot of old um, thirty five millimeter films. Even when they're all hanging up, you know, just the the core of old films. Um, this is a question that uh, this is a fan question. Um, so it's, it's a little goofy. Um, who's your uh, favorite Teletubby? I don't know. I like uh, the red one. Oh, yeah. Okay. Word. A any reason why? It's just funny. It's just funny. They just from the funny looking, funny looking things. You know, they got like different little pajama suits, little PJ suits. <laughs> yeah, dude. I think you'd make a great album cover uh, and a little Teletubby outfit someday. 
But, uh, you know, with that being said, dude, I don't want to take up any more of your time, yeah, Cool Keith, yeah. man. I really appreciate uh, you doing the interview. All of Cool Keith's links will be down in the description below. Uh, thank you so much for your time, man. Thank you, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Anytime, you know, you need the truth and, you know, all kinds of legitimate information, feel free to talk to me. Appreciate it, bro. Likewise, anything you need, man, got you. Yeah.